Hello, and welcome to PodCash, the portable professional development podcast from Cash. Thanks for joining us. My name's Dawn, and I'm the editor of Cash Alumni. And I can't introduce this week's guest as well as she can introduce herself, so... Can you tell the people who will be listening um, a little bit about who you are and what it is that you do? So, my name is Mine Jonk Bayer. For those of you out there who don't know what I do, I'm very passionate about getting neuroscience informed knowledge into early years training and qualifications and I'm sure we'll come on to that with regard to cash in a moment or two. I've just completed my PhD in exploring that very idea of getting that information from neuroscience into our qualifications and training and I also explored as part of that why that hasn't been the case for so many years and I look at the barriers and the enablers to knowledge transfer with regard to neuroscience and early years so yeah that's been taking up my life for the past three years mainly I've also started writing my updated addition to my neuroscience in early childhood book and I'm writing a brand new book on self-regulation so yeah lots lots to do wow that all sounds really really exciting um congratulations on finishing your phd I did say that you'd submitted your final yeah, um, but most people are like oh you must be so relieved and I was like I'm devastated because it was like you know my food my drink my life it for so long and I think it's quite a critical area that I've looked into as well given the way children are treated and misunderstood in early years and these you know the way we treat our children has a long-term impact we don't realize it now perhaps but how we respond to their behaviors you know, and, and their needs to communicate how they're feeling if they are dysregulated, for example. We do often misunderstand those cues as adults, and I think our own mental health and our own issues and preoccupations further inhibit us from looking at that child with objective, caring eyes, to be honest. And, you know, that's another element of my PhD, just looking into how we can address this honestly as adults, as parents, as well as practitioners. So, yeah, I I miss my PhD, but like you said, I've got lots going on, so (laughs) I don't have any gaps, which I'm pleased to say. Well, um, well, I didn't think you'd have any gaps. Um, We all know that you don't stay still for very long. Um, Neuroscience sounds very complicated. Um, It sounds maybe a bit intimidating. So can you tell us a little bit more about what neuroscience is and why it's so important in terms of early years education? I'm going to give the most basic response to that just so that I don't bore listeners straight off. But neuroscience, simply put, is the study of the brain and the eyes included and the nervous system and it's also about our behavior and our well-being because the brain and body are inextricably linked so everything that happens to us as adults children babies in utero happens at that neural level and then as we get older that plays itself out behaviorally And I think it's absolutely critical that adults understand, for example, the neuroscience of early brain development and behaviour, because without that understanding, we tend, like I said earlier on, to misinterpret what we see. We judge very quickly, but we don't think about the impact of that child's environment on their brain. And that's what neuroscience is enabling us to do even more precisely now in 2019 and I think we need to harness this knowledge to further enhance our policies and our practices with very young children. And I'm guessing that you're not a children should be seen and not heard sort of person. What I'm concerned about Dawn, I was watching a children's program yesterday with my daughter and they were having a snapshot into Victorian education. As we know, that's exactly what you said. You know, children should be seen and not heard and the threat of the cane. But I don't want to over dramatize now, but I think we're regressing and I think we are going back to that Victorian mentality of rote learning you know, the emphasis on behaviour above anything else and, you know, those three R's. And I do believe it's to our children's detriment because it's created a fit in or do one mentality. Children are not born to learn by rote. They are inquisitive, curious human beings that deserve to be provided with, you know, immense, endless opportunities for learning in ways that are, that 
capture their imagination, not our agendas driving that learning. And that's what we are in today. And it really, really concerns I'm an adult, as we all know, you know, those of you that know my work, you know, I've come from that trauma background. It's only recently that it was, t- shouldn't say this, but I'm going to because hey ho, that's what we're here to do, inform people, that I have ADHD. I was stunned, but then the person said, why on earth does that surprise you? Look at how you conduct your life. And I was like, oh yes, true light bulb moment. But our educators aren't trained to do that. They are trained to do the literacy, the numeracy, the behaviour management. I detest that term. It doesn't work for our children. The revision of the EYFS early learning goals that, you know, again, those of you that know my work, I am very vocal about. They're teaching us to say, for example, understand self-regulation, which is, by the way, Dawn, the most important skill that we need to nurture in our children they would have our practitioners believe that it's teaching children to take instructions and go to the toilet and make healthy food choices it's erroneous it's narrow and it doesn't cover the complex spectrum of what self-regulation actually is nor does it look at the uh, pivotal role of co-regulation in nurturing like with, with cash alumni we often um, speak to members um, who grew up um in school being told that they weren't very academically gifted um so you know being told more that they couldn't than they could than, than they could um and a lot of those practitioners who've gone into roles within health and social care early years education um working as ministry practitioners and domiciliary care workers have huge amounts of skill um but have developed a mindset over the course of their life that they can't that's the messaging that they've had um, throughout yeah. their education. Um, do you think that that is becoming more prevalent as it sort of move towards a more academic um, primary education and early years education? Yes, because the mere fact that our children are being tested and graded, my goodness, I can't believe I'm saying it, at four or five years old is, again, a perfect example of that. And it's also, and you know, an example of that fixed mindset when we're being told we can't do it, you can't do it, that's your limit, it's wrong, don't do it that way. And and there is no room for growth, neurally, behaviourally, or personally, that child will then grow up going, well, I can't do that, that's my limit. I was told I'm rubbish at that, I was told don't try to do that because I'll fail. That's my cap in life. And we, we are taught that very early on. And it does stay, it does tend to stay with us throughout our educational careers. I am an example of that. I'm sure, you know, there are thousands of us out there who've got teachers that, you know, demotivated them, that made them believe they, you know, were of no use. I've been told pretty much that in my time as well, and it does stick. And I think as part of that teaching of the neuroscience of early brain development, Uh, understanding the growth mindset and how to instill that in our children through our language, our behaviour, the the learning opportunities we afford them. I think it all has to be included in our early years offer as well as primary, but especially as uh, children get that little bit older and enter primary school. I think any opportunity to, to create a positive change has all but gone because it then really does become about your grades and your outcomes and where you are at. And that really does need to change. Why does every stage need to be a prep for the next stage? Allow our children to just be and they will show us their infinite potential. Each and every one of them will be able to show us their unfettered infinite potential and we do not allow for that to happen and then we end up misjudging them and labeling them as not good enough and it has to change yeah i mean i think that that works um on both sides of that as well um my story is a little bit different in that um i was very academic as a child um i'm not a very practical person and i'm not very good at necessarily carrying out the things that i've been able to put down on paper Um, So I think that a lot of people who go through school 
and are actually on the other side of that, you can't or you can, um, mm. are set up for this false reality where they believe that they're going to go into a workplace and that it's going to be dead easy because school's been very easy. Um, yeah. When actually, because they haven't been developed um, mm. in terms of those practical and those vocational skills and that exploration yes. of yes. vocations rather than just careers and jobs, you're not given a chance to to find out that you're bad at those things. So then you go out into re- to the real world and think, wow, I'm fantastic. I've been told I'm fantastic. Yeah, you're fantastic at following orders and completing your worksheet, but they are not ready for life. And we have Sir Ken Robinson, who's given so many wonderful talks, read most of his books. He's absolutely brilliant. And, and he tells us that, you know, when we go out into the workplace, we're not fit. We're just not fit to be in the real world, in the world of work. And I've seen so many news reports recently, Dawn, where they're talking of a crisis in the workplace. Why? Because they are failing to show initiative. There is no creativity and no imagination. Yeah, and I think um, we've also got that problem on that teaching you how to conform bit of now the social media is a thing um, and it is scary the idea of failing because a lot of us it would be very public um, to fail now um, even at a very young age because our entire life is broadcasted. Um, I think the, that idea of being creative or, or doing more stuff it can make it much more scary in today's world because we haven't been taught that failure is okay and um, because there is this emphasis on succeeding we've lost the ability to, to to maybe try a lot of things it's difficult to put yourself out there and to, to take a risk and to to give something a go um, I was very much a child who would exclude myself from things because I don't like not being good at stuff looking silly or you know failing it is Dawn what all of what you're talking about is encompassed in that fixed versus growth mindset I'm going to fail, therefore I'm so scared of doing it, I'm not going to do it. So you're self-limiting in, in, in that process. And I think, again, if our teachers were trained from the perspective of neuroscience, growth mindset, Carol Dweck's done wonderful work on this subject. And I just think we have got so much knowledge that we could use that we're not being encouraged to utilise. And to go back to your very first question, you said, can you tell me a little bit about neuroscience? There's a lot of fear around the whole language. And you're absolutely right. And it frustrates me to no end. And that is one of the key barriers I found as part of my doctoral research. It's the fear around the language and getting it wrong. My argument is, if we don't put ourselves out there and say, why on earth can't I read up on this? <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me, but we are to- we are actually told by some neuroscientists and some academics, don't touch it, it's not for you, you are not intelligent enough. If we don't have access to this knowledge, then we are, you know, the simple earliest practitioners. We're here to care for our babies and children, and that's it. No, sorry, that isn't it at all. And this knowledge can empower us to no end, and I think we need to be further encouraged to do so. Hence why I teamed up with Cash, and we are about to launch that first ever neuroscience-informed qualification, which I'm so excited about because that shows trust and belief in something. And I think yeah, you know, and it is really exciting. Um, and one of the great things about your writing is that it's quite easy to understand. So it's full of yeah. really sort of obviously well um, thought out and, and well referenced academic language, but it's also pitched at anybody being able to read it. So it people can enjoy reading it. It's not a heavy academic text that no. is difficult to, no. to sort of wade through. It's it's written for real people. And I'm um, glad you mentioned that sorry to interject because that's that's Sorry. another issue for people it's well actually I, I can't grapple with it you know a lot of the textbooks are levels five six and for example there is one textbook that really infuriated me and it was all it was talking about the post conceptualization of neuroscience and how it isn't fit for purpose in early years and I I spoke to one of the authors and again it ended in in a it was a no-go basically and my point was 
How can we post conceptualize about something when it hasn't even had the opportunity to be a firmly established concept in early years? Moreover, why don't you write a book that's accessible, that can then enable practitioners and parents and whoever else is interested in the subject to grapple with that subject and, and identify with it? Because I defy anyone to tell me it isn't relevant to anyone. We're parents, grandparents, we're carers, we're foster carers, we're adoptive carers, we're teachers, we're earliest practitioners. Everyone has to understand this. And that's what I do through my, uh, like you mentioned, the online training programs, they've achieved awards. You know, the testament for me was in February when I had, you know, my conference sold out. And I was like, wow, people do really want to listen, Dawn. And it felt so, good for me it was like this is important people are interested in it who are we to thwart that from happening I've got my next conference coming up in March 2020 and again it's going to take it that one step further because I will have professor professors and researchers talking about how they are utilizing this knowledge straight from neuroimaging studies into their classrooms and I think it's such an exciting time. It really is. Um, I mean, I recently read a book um, by a gentleman called Steve Silverman, um, who wrote a book called Neurotribes, um, which is about the history of autism and ADHD research, um, looking at that idea of how we work with autistic children. For me, just read as how we should work with children. Um, I think there's a lot of lessons that we could learn from that in terms of actually I mean, would would you say that just generally children are neurodiverse, that they're, they're all different and that they all have different things that they need and want and, and, and Absolutely. Feel. I mean, absolutely. That you've said everything as I believe it to be, Dawn. You know, to a greater or lesser extent, we are all different. I have my quirks and foibles and downright, you know, I am neuro. Uh, diverse just as you mentioned you are and I just don't think that our education system is designed in a way to cater for these needs at all we're talking about very young children who are not being diagnosed who are not going through the process oh it's taking too much time oh it costs too much money and there's a lot of obfuscation a lot of delays and I think it's so unnecessary but I also think that if it goes back again in my opinion to the training of our practitioners our teachers if it covers all of these wonderful wonderful diversities i don't think the educational experience would be as bad as it is for so many children we're talking about children you know because there tends to be a comorbidity between these conditions as well so like we mentioned that aces adhd with the anxiety with the autism but children it's just like they are not supported. To go back to self-regulation and the five domains of the stresses for our children, you know, there are stresses in each of these domains, like biological, physical, social, pro-social, for example, and the triggers that exist in a classroom for a child who is neurodiverse, but I would argue actually quite a few children anyway, like you're looking at cluttered walls, very noisy, not enough room to move. I mean, these things and a whole other list would make a child very frustrated and dysregulated and distressed and what we're finding time and time again is that these children are being told off for displaying this dysregulation showing their their teachers i can't cope we are still heavily reliant upon behavior management policies and approaches that are failing our children and they do need to be issued in favour of more relational approaches. I, I, yeah, I can totally understand how that would work um, and again, I don't mean to make you swear um, but you talked about behaviour management a little bit there and, and we've mentioned it a couple of times I know that you were heavily involved in petitioning against um, a TV programme on Channel 4 that was aired called Train Your Baby Like a Dog yeah. Um, yeah. We did write an article about it for Cash Alumni um, called Don't Train Your Baby Like a Dog What is it about that approach of changing behavior that is so damaging it's cruel cruel. they're not working with dogs animals they're working with young children who only learn through that social context and through nurture not by giving pellets like some pavlovian experiment i nearly swore dawn you had to do it 
you know it's just it it doesn't teach them anything other than to conform we need to allow our children to be themselves if they cry you know that child actually was proximity seeking yeah i think one of the things for me was just that idea of that actually if we take away children's ability to communicate through behavior um that is all we're doing we're taking away their ability to tell us that something is wrong what we need to do is figure out what is making children behave that way and removing that thing that hurts so do you think that we're still educationally um sort of stuck in those days where we are training children for jobs where they would just do as they're told rather than we are expected to go and actually make an impact and if you speak to any millennial or any generation z um person um you know the things that people 30 and below tend to look for in a workplace is the ability to make a difference it's the opportunity to 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 help other people and to, to you know to make change um yeah, I do. Well, I think, like I mentioned earlier on, Dawn, like, what of il- enlightenment, you know, I just think we are in such an old, dusty education system that isn't enabling our children to be creative and imaginative. And like you mentioned there, the millennials and, and looking at future jobs, we don't even know what these future jobs are going to look like. So how on earth are they, like, channeling our children to be something when we don't know what that end point should look like? We don't know how it will look. There's a plethora of research out there that shows us how wonderfully children can thrive in you know different education systems you know where there is no testing and grading and this obsession with outcomes that is not doing our children any good I, I do think we need a, a massive change in direction definitely yeah I mean I was speaking to Adam Chapman who was an early years lecturer in a college a few weeks ago um, which is the most recently published episode of the podcast Adam was saying that actually left his education um, in terms of becoming an early years practitioner and hadn't been told the value of play. Um, he was more from a, he, he came at it from a standard point of view um, and actually learned the value of play and of exploration as he went through his career and is now a huge advocate of free play and, and of children being able to find their own path. That Ever is something, that path. Yeah, that, that is something that we're finding is disappearing more and more. Um, but obviously practitioners are under a lot of pressure from the schools that they feed into and then um, again, you know, those regulators and, and the decision makers and the policy makers further up the road. We can't necessarily change the mind of those massive policy makers, but what small changes do you think that practitioners could make in their day-to-day work with children that, that would make an impact? Little things. Honestly, they might seem trivial and inconsequential, but I think daring to take on your leadership team, if there is that resistance to change and doing things a bit differently because I see a lot of practitioners after I've given a keynote and they say oh you know what you've said it really resonates with me but my leadership team won't go for that they're all about for example behavior management and the play is very structured so if there is something that you want to try ask to try it show them actually look at the effect it's having on this child it's so much more positive nappy change times this is an age-old issue that i'm surprised and upset that i still get told really they say oh you know because i talk about the importance of that, that moment with that child and you're changing their nappy and it's such an intimate thing for that child you know it's all about trust and they're being you know they're vulnerable and it's very quick and it's very rushed What about the eye contact? What about making time to just have that one-on-one, sing a song, have a little babble with them, smiles? Yeah, no, we forget that, you know, we're too busy. Whoa, hang on a minute, this is a vulnerable little human being here. Come on, like, where's your love, the empathy, the understanding? So small things like that. Some people say, you know, um, the, the structuring of the times for the breaks doesn't work. Quite, again, quite simply, try it another way then. And they do, and they're like, oh my goodness, so we made the lunch break a little bit earlier and it freed up time in this bit. And, you know, so many things can be done in that day-to-day practice if people just think, 
you know what, as a team, let's look at this set up with different eyes. Let's go and reflect on it together and let's look at what we can do that doesn't cost any money, perhaps, you know, that we don't need to run through loads of rings to do and see how it goes. I think that daring to think outside of the box and to then implement that can go very, very far. So my my bottom line is here, dare to be different and everything else that we discuss falls under that umbrella. Oh, that's a really nice line, I like that one. In terms of their interests, children are often the expert and that's definitely true. Um, for example, with my nephew, he's really, really into dinosaurs um, and he's three years old and he can name more dinosaurs than I could identify. Um, yeah. So there'd be no point in me sitting down with Carlton and talking to him about, you know, trying to teach him about dinosaurs. But I could ask him about dinosaurs and he will teach me and that can be an amazing learning experience for children. Um, Absolutely. I've always said that in pretty much all the talks I give and in the books I write trust the children they are the experts and they will show you what's ignited their interest what more could you want wow you go with them on that learning journey you're not dictating the path and the end point of that journey leave it to them they are the experts in their world yeah i I mean i totally agree that that is really important having that freedom to to play and to experiment um i must have been the only jazz musician um who was scared to improvise so I was quite happy playing in the band um, yeah. but really hated the idea of doing a solo because actually what if I get it wrong um, yeah. because I'm just making it up it took me until my 30s to, yes. to really be comfortable with right. being uncomfortable um, yeah. and it's only these last few years that I've been able to do really good things because I've been able to sort of take a few more risks yeah, um, and we, we don't teach that resilience in our children enough. Um, don't get me wrong as well, because I always tend to sound very negative, And I know that there are pockets of absolutely wonderful practice out there. But I do think we are disservicing our children. This fear of failure is absolutely crippling, especially for our children. I see it in uh, children in my daughter's class. And, you know, they said, no, I don't want to do it. I'm going to get it wrong. And they'll now be crying at the thought of getting it wrong. So the one thing I say to Delilah, whenever we're doing the homework now or discussing something, whatever it might be, but I'm going to get it wrong and then I'm going to get in trouble. I said, you know what? I said, I hope you get it wrong because I love it when I get things wrong. I said, you know why? And I talk to her about our brains all the time. I said, because we're creating new motorways in our brain. When we get it wrong, we find another way. And that makes our neurons talk to each other even more excitedly. And like, I'll show her the little videos for children. And she gets it, Dawn. And now her mindset has changed. And I'm so proud of that. We should encourage children because that's when we go on different journeys, isn't it? Mentally, when we get it wrong, we go down a wrong route. Oh, okay, initiative time, we'll have to try this and then that. And that is our brains growing in response to these different experiences, carving out different neural pathways as a result of something going wrong. We're finding an alternative. We are we're not being dictated to in terms of what to do and how to do it because that is not going to serve us in the next situation or the next opportunity or in five years or ten years but when you work out how to overcome a challenge that does stay with you because you remember how it felt in your body you remember the excitement you remember the strategies you adopted that cannot be taught. I wholeheartedly believe it needs to be more open-ended. It needs to, again, be more trusting of the child to be able to be that effective learner, The you know, the learner that has in their armory lots of different uh, strategies to overcome these challenges, to complete tasks in ways that are comfortable to them and they're not dictated to because they are really, I think they're geniuses, like Piaget called children, you know, they're, they're, they're lone scientists and they are. They construct meaning by engaging with their worlds, not by being told how to do it. That doesn't work. 
their their bodies their minds need to be exploring creative and you know draw their own conclusions from all that exploration and i don't think there's enough room for that and i think the learning experience would be so much more enriching and rewarding for our children and teachers would probably feel less put upon if they were allowed to relinquish some of that control and put the children uh, you know in the driving seat in their learning experiences so to speak i really do believe that that's great and I mean the challenges of that obviously um, playing devil's advocate a little bit um, obviously a practitioner isn't a child's world and that there's lots of influences come from home um, and from their social situation and from all of the other places that they are outside of school or nursery how then do practitioners deal with um, what might currently be termed as bad behavior yeah there is no bad behavior there's no challenging behavior i know you know that but i just want to say it out loud before i explode <laughs> i think <laughs> i told you i was playing devil's advocate didn't it <laughs> <laughs> safeguard from mini explosions and expletives i completely yeah i agree with you there um i don't think there's a quick fit conversely having said that there are quick ways we can change our approach if we are allowed to and if we allow ourselves to because some adults too wholeheartedly believe in in behavior management well no otherwise chaos will you know this that and the other well no that's not the case so for example next march i've got dr janet rose giving one of the keynotes at my conference and i'd love you to come if you can by the way and um she's going to be talking about emotion coaching and it's four very simple steps that yes, are steeped in knowledge from neuroscience, but when we're looking at behavior, we're talking about, well, actually first then in emotion, in emotion coaching, we're looking at four steps. Number one is recognizing the child's feelings and empathizing with them. Dawn, I don't think this happens nearly enough as it should be happening because if it were, we wouldn't be getting so many children being excluded and reprimanded so the initial move is that recognition and empathizing step two is then validating the feelings and labeling them giving them names i can see you're really hurt i can see you're really angry that must have really upset you blah 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 because that validating is halfway through diffusing those feelings intensity when you're a very young child say two three four especially and you are overcome with such feelings of say anger or frustration and you might not have the linguistic capacity to say oh i'm feeling very upset right now because that child took my pencil or you know i didn't sleep last night because mum and dad were rowing again but it's manifesting in your behavior steps one and two are absolutely critical in helping that child to go <sighs> oh, okay, someone's recognized me. Someone's seen that I'm hurt. Someone's going to be there for me. Step three. To be honest, Millie, I don't think that those two steps apply just to children. Um, I've got a background in working in customer service and in homelessness and, and employability support for people who struggle a little bit. And actually, just generally in customer service, one of the most valuable lessons I was ever taught was that when people shout at you when you work in customer service it's never because you've done something that has upset them it's usually because they've come to that interaction with the baggage of their day and they've had x y and z happen and they are in this frame of mind so actually that acknowledging how they're feeling and letting them know that you understand how they feel the way that they feel is one of the biggest empathy isn't it yeah it's that connection before correction and by the way emotion coaching is for each and every one of us it's for me it's for you it's for every other adult it's for neurodiverse children and adults and i just think we have a lot to learn from it and going back to i mean step three if there is some aggression in that in that context we then would set limits on the behavior so it's i it's completely okay to feel the way you do but it's not okay to hit or it's not okay to throw a chair so it's showing that, that what I'm demonstrating here to you is that connection is key before we try and correct and redirect. And that final fourth step is to then problem solve with the child. You know, once we've managed to hopefully calm them down, we've connected and they feel like they can trust us because we do need to win their trust. 
we then can say you know I completely understand you know that really wound you up it really you know upset you what do you think we could do differently next time how can we help you to prevent it from blowing up and and what what could you do if we can't regulate our own feelings and our own responses to situations uh, you know that anger the trauma that you know some of us have gone through we cannot thrive in life we might just about survive through may i add maladaptive behaviors which are very self-limiting ultimately like let's say in my experience it's o ocd it's a regimented routine i think yeah but i'm all right because i'm happy no actually what you're doing is shutting off a lot of your life but it feels safe because that's what i'm used to and it's self-regging enables you to take a step away from that and go no i can handle this i've got some resilience and these are the things i can do to help myself to prevent me from f flipping my lid for example oh mini i could talk to you all day there's a million things firing off in my brain about the idea of your know, self-regulation actually for me i didn't really learn how to self-regulate until a few years ago in terms of it was that I hadn't even recognised what my triggers were or why I got to the end of my tether so I realised that having spent all day in a workplace where everything was really busy the overhead lights really yes. make me overstimulated yes, so being at right. home we don't have any overhead lights anymore we have lamps right. with hippie type you know drapes over the top yeah, of them yeah. because that softer light makes a huge yes. difference to but just, just to how this, overly right. stimulated i am um, absolutely but this is key for children in very hectic hustle bustle type classrooms dawn and one of the case mm -hmm. studies brought to my attention as part of the online training i did was that one child you know did come from a chaotic background had ADHD, couldn't settle in, often getting told off. And, and he then, you know, through the self-reg approach that I was um, training them in, he, he was able to say, the lights hurt my eyes. I can't, I can't think. So they changed it. They did, adopted a very similar approach to you. The stark lighting was removed, you know, a lot of uh, calmer tones on the walls removed all the clutter and it was calmer. So it enabled him to regulate better. And then what do we get? We get more grounded children who are able to take ownership of their bodies and their brains and that learning experience and say, hey guys, this isn't working for me. Can we try another way? How amazing is that for that child that they are being uh, empowered? And that's what we need to do for each and every child, empower them with the knowledge about their own brains and bodies and say to them, hey, you know, when there are times when you're not feeling okay and you're about to flip your lid, these are the things that we can do together. And I think that can last them a lifetime. You said you've only learned how to self-reg a few years ago. I'm still on that journey because it's not a fixed prescription that works each and every time in the same way for each person. But if we give these children these skills and this understanding from the very beginning, they will learn that they are worthy of love, that they are not bad, that they are not incompetent, but they are strong, resilient, powerful human beings. And that's where we need to be. Well, that's amazing. And I would normally ask for a final thought, but I think actually that that last line that you said is an amazing sort of thing for people to take away is that actually that it is about giving children the tools um, rather than telling them how to work through a situation. Yeah. Um, so that they can keep using that toolkit for the rest of their lives. So would it be okay for you to give our audience a little rundown of, of where they can find you online and how they can link in with the work that you're doing and, and get a little bit more information to, to, to implement some of these things? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Mine Jonk Bio. I'm on Twitter. <laughs> My Twitter handle is at Mine uh, EY Mind. And I'm on Facebook also. And for your listeners, Dawn, I'd gladly um, give a discount if they are interested in attending my conference on Saturday, the 28th of March, 2020. So they can get in touch with me, um, like I said, via Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook, and I'll gladly give them a 20% discount on tickets and it's going to be a posh lunch served. And it will be all about the practical application of findings from neuroscience. So I mentioned Dr. Janet Rose doing emotion coaching. We've got Action Amanda, who is going to be, actually, we won't be sat down for her keynote. We're going to be up and active, looking at the impact of 
um, movement, early movement on early brain development. I think that's another critical issue that needs addressing in early years. We've got Dr. Richard Churches, who's uh, doing some fantastic work on neuroscience um, and, and how it can be applied in the classroom on a daily basis. And we've got Jackie Wilson, founder of Empower Education, who again will be sharing so many practical strategies to help build resilience and self-regulation from, say, two, three years old right up to adulthood. So it's going to be jam-packed. That's amazing. Um, and I'm also going to speak, be speaking at the cash conferences this year. Um, oh, yes, and obviously you've had yeah you are um and that we have um that qualification launching um in the new year thank you so much for your time Annie. it's been amazing to talk to you um just in case anyone has not read the show notes or the title of the episode you can help us find the spelling of Minnie's name in those notes and yeah thanks so much for your time. i could talk to you all day and thanks to you at home or on the go for joining us don't forget if you've got some best practice or you'd like to share with us um, something great um, you can get in touch with us at alumni at cash.org.uk that's alumni a-l-u-m-n-i at cash c-a-c-h-e for echo dot org dot uk and we'd love to speak to you you can find us at the cash alumni website at www.cashalumni.org.uk or through the main CASH website for information about qualifications and other CPD at www.cachevacle.org.uk. Thanks very much and until next time, take care.